week, even though there's not any fireworks. If, you, if you're one of those who goes every week and you know, maybe you get there early and you help plug in the coffee pot and turn on the lights, because of you, there will be a church when somebody in this city over the course of this next year gets hit by that two by four and has to go home because there's nowhere else to go. Thanks to you, there'll be a church for them to go to. And you welcomed me, and you made me your sister in Christ. Blessed are you. Great is your reward in heaven. Blessed are you. Thank you for that, and thank you, too, on behalf of whoever's wandering these streets today that is going to come home in this coming year. Thank you for them, for keeping the church open for them. And the second thing I wanted to say is that... um, If God can reach me, he can reach anybody, but nobody is beyond his reach. Every conversion is an inside job. You know, things come from the outside, it's like rain pattering you. Sometimes they persuade you or not, but a true conversion happens in the heart. And um, the Lord desires that every man be saved, every person be saved. And the scriptures tell us that that's the yearning of his heart. He loves everyone. He wants everyone to come to him. And the Holy Spirit is getting that person surrounded, just like he got me surrounded. The Holy Spirit is, you know, setting up these situations that may just rock that person, like the string of little odd experiences kind of rocked me. Um, It may not be that you are supposed to think of the right line of argument to use. I mean, here comes Thanksgiving, here comes Christmas. Maybe this is somebody you only see a few times a year, and you're trying to plot out, you know, how the dialogue might go. God doesn't really need you to do that. If you, if you don't feel like you have an explicit call to do that, then maybe just be quiet, because the Lord is so capable of reaching that person by other means. I met a, um, a missionary to the Middle East um, who was, who's, whose particular field was bringing the gospel to Muslims. And I said, that must be extremely hard. I can't imagine how difficult that is. And she said, well, 75% of the time, a Muslim who comes to Christ, it's because they had either a dream or a vision. So that shows you God is not bound. In the psalm it says, by my God I can leap over a wall, and um, our God can leap over whatever walls people put up. So I join my prayers to yours for whoever it is you're praying for, and encourage you to think of my story, that God is always able to reach people, and that he does it really from the inside, starts on the inside. Well, there was, um, my story kind of has two parts. There's um, from Eastern religions to Christianity to the Western religion of Christianity. And then from Western Christianity to Eastern Orthodoxy. How did that happen? Um, My husband, as I told you, he'd had, he'd sort of set one foot in Christianity, but I talked him out of really becoming a Christian. Nevertheless, he found that he was fascinated by theology. He just liked reading theology. And given a choice of graduating from college, getting a job, or going to graduate school in theology, he chose to go to graduate school in theology. And it was, the, um, it was actually the liberal theologians, the German theologians like Bultmann, who said, you don't have to believe in the miracles, you don't have to believe in the resurrection. That like opened a door that my husband could go through. So um, we went off to seminary, Episcopal Seminary in Virginia, and both of us were you know, our, I had had this wonderful experience, but neither of us were really conventional Christians, and we didn't, didn't have anything like classic theology. Um, we were going on Sundays to a church where the pastor explicitly said, when we say the Nicene Creed, you don't have to say the whole thing. Just if there are parts that you don't agree with, just don't say that part. So this is like, yes, this is so great. All churches should be like this. He was giving communion to everybody, whether or not they were Christian. It was like, we have to be inclusive. Um, we were so on board with that, with that theology at that point. But um, in God's mercy, we, we met some other students who, who helped us to understand that it was possible to take Jesus as your Lord and to pray a prayer like that. Um, my husband had grown up uh, Episcopalian. I'd grown up Catholic. And when he said, well, did you ever pray the sinner's prayer and take Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? We said, we're not Baptists. <laughs> that was the only thing we could associate it with. 
Um, but thank God for those friends of ours who led us into a, a, a firmer and deeper faith. And gradually our theology began to kind of get into line with the, with the classic faith of Christianity. So we went to Episcopal Seminary, um, gradually becoming more and more committed to a small Orthodox Christian faith. Graduated. My husband was made a priest. Um, <clears throat> I also went to seminary and wanted to be a priest. I was still you know, really a feminist in those days. But uh, they had just begun ordaining women in the Episcopal Church, so I was like, I would, I would wait a few years. Um, and after a few years of seeing how hard my husband worked, how really uh, often unrewarding the job of a pastor is, and how very difficult it is, and how exhausting it is, I realized I was really not cut out for that kind of work. Um, so I was home with our three kids. I was teaching natural childbirth classes, um, teaching Bible studies, and so forth. Over the years, we became concerned about the direction the church was going. At the time we were in seminary, the, um, the liberal theology was mostly just confined to the seminaries and the books written by theologians and so forth. But by the late 80s, early 90s, um, people were, like bishops, like Bishop Spong in New Jersey, were speaking out explicitly that um, Jesus didn't rise from the dead, that, that um, gosh, awful stuff about... Mary not being a virgin, stuff that kind of makes me queasy now to think about it, um, denying the resurrection, denying all the tenets of cr classic Christian faith. And what was disturbing to us was we saw there was no corrective in the system. There was no way for anybody to stand up and say, that's not right, that's not the authentic Christian faith. It was so big tent that really anything that anybody wanted to say was allowed. So gradually became discouraged and concerned about the direction that the church was going theologically. This was long before currently the church, the Episcopal Church is often in the headlines because of ordaining gay people and gay marriage and so forth. It was, it was long before that. It was really about theology at that point. And um, my husband banded together with five other local Episcopal priests and they put out a document they called the Baltimore Declaration. <clears throat> and uh, trying to reestablish what the church should believe. But it, it had no impact, basically. Um, I think the turning point for us came that I was at the National Convention in 1991, and I was present in the House of Bishops when there was a um, resolution proposed that Episcopal clergy should abstain from sex outside of marriage. Um, this was actually proposed by a conservative bishop just as a a uh, way of testing, like, we're all still on board with this, aren't we? I mean, at least this we agree on. And uh, I was there as that, um, as that there was a roll call vote, and that resolution was defeated. Um, they could not affirm that in the House of Bishops, our leadership. So I, I went out to a phone booth um, and phoned my husband. I was in tears, and I said, this isn't a church. This, this, I don't know what it is. It's a... Um, social services agency with really great aesthetics. But, but it is not a church. It has no intention of following its Lord. So at that point, we started thinking, well, where are we going to go? Um, my husband thought maybe one of those continuing breakaway Anglican churches. But as he thought about that, he said, really, I can't go on from a, from a branch to a twig to a leaf. I need to get back to the trunk, to the roots of the tree somehow. So we thought, well, that means becoming Roman Catholic. We just assumed that would be the next step. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just skip over that exploration, but eventually we decided that wasn't for us because we had some theological problems, some theological questions. And also because although they were beginning um, to admit Episcopal and maybe Lutheran as well, pastors who were married to become Catholic priests, um, there was so much bad feeling about that in the church and from so many directions that the people who wanted women in the priesthood saw this as supplying more priests from a separate you know, venue that was going to delay actually getting women in the priesthood. And conservatives felt like, well, you know, dear Father Maroney, you know, who was a faithful, lifelong Catholic priest, when he fell in love and got married, he had to leave the church. And here's somebody that's coming from the outside and get to take his place. Um, there was, it, it just was like too hot, you know, too much going on there. I, I would say the theology was the bigger concern. Um, we had never really heard of Eastern Orthodoxy. 
We grew up in, it's cold in here, isn't it? I see so many people like this, my, my hands are so cold, I wish I had gloves. Um, <laughs> we grew up in Charleston, South Carolina, where there was exactly one Orthodox church, and it was a Greek Orthodox church, and the only people who went there were Greek people, and you couldn't go in the door unless your name ended in an S. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure they would have welcomed us, but that was just the way we looked at it. We looked at it as their ethnic church. And... Um, uh, a friend of ours who was a Lutheran pastor phoned my husband about 1991 and said, um, there's an Orthodox priest coming to town to give some talks. I've asked him to come to my house on Wednesday night, and I'm just inviting all my friends who are pastors, and we'll listen to him talk. His name is Father Peter Gilquist. And some of you recognize that name. He, was, uh, he reposed about a year and a half, two years ago, um, that he was like one of the strongest Orthodox evangelists um, of, the, of the modern age. In the 1980s, he, he was a campus crusade pastor. He and some of his other campus crusade friends realized that they could do a, a revival on campus, get a lot of people make a decision for Christ, come back, six, come back six months later, and they'd all drifted back away again. And they said, we need some kind of an organization that people can plug into where there will be people who are already more mature in the faith who can continue teaching them and leading them where they can hear the scripture. They ought to pray, too. They realized they were reinventing the church. That's what they actually were looking for, was a church. So they assigned each of them something to study in the early church. How did the early church handle the scriptures? How did they handle leadership? How did they do worship? Um, as they would report back every few months and get together to discuss this, they realized they were reinventing the Orthodox Church. And so they declared themselves the Evangelical Orthodox Church, laid hands on each other, you know, ordained each other, got vestments off the Internet or someplace. And um, a few years later, thank God, they met up with um, the head of the Antiochian Orthodox Church. This would be the, the Middle Eastern uh, Church from Lebanon and Syria, um, Metropolitan Philip, and were able to transition into the canonical, the real Orthodox Church. That was 1987, and over a course of two weeks, 2,000 people were brought into the Orthodox Church, all um, evangelicals in California. So Father Peter is a very, very persuasive uh, speaker, and he later said he thought my husband was the one person there that night who would never become Orthodox because he asked such tough questions. Um, but really it was because he was so intense about finding, finding the right place to go. And... Uh, what happened next is what happens really to a lot of couples. Um, my husband investigated orthodoxy, and Father Peter says, what you've really got to do is go to a service. A service will, will tell you so much more than just reading books. So he went downtown in Baltimore, attended a Vesper service on a Saturday night, came back, and it was like he'd fallen in love all over again. It was like, this is the most wonderful church. This is the great, this is the, I have to be a member of this church. This is so great. And... Uh, I was like, really? I mean, really? That's pretty sudden. Yes, yes, I have to be in this church. Um, he's not like that at all. So I thought, wow, something happened. So the following Saturday night, I went with him. And uh, what happened to us is what happens to a lot of couples. I'm going to read you the first two paragraphs of my book, Facing East. <clears throat> Got another sip of water. He was an Episcopal priest, but he was standing in an Orthodox church this Saturday night and thinking about truth, capital T. At the altar, a gold-robed priest strode back and forth, swinging incense, moving in and out of the doors of the iconostasis, according to rubrics that were as yet unfamiliar. Golden bells chimed against the censer, and the light was smoky and dim. Over to the left, a small choir was singing in haunting harmony, Voices twining in a cappella simplicity. The truth part was this. The ancient words of this vesperal service had been chanted for more than a millennium. Lex orandi, lex credendi. That means what people pray, the law of prayer, is the law of belief, of credo, of belief. What people pray is going to shape what they believe. So this was a church that had never and could never apostatize because they don't change. They keep using the ancient prayers that keeps them in the same faith. So that's what he, my husband was thinking. She was his wife, and she was standing next to him thinking about her feet. They hurt. 
She wondered why they have pews if you have to stand up all the time. The struggling choir was weak and singing in an unintelligible language that may have been English. The few other worshipers weren't participating in the service in any visible way. This really bothered me because I was used to an evangelical, you know, we were swinging and swaying and singing the same, I love you, Jesus, I love you, Jesus, 47 times. And in, in orthodoxy, they might just be standing there like this. And I would think, well, they're not praying. <laughs> uh, why weren't they participating in the service? Why did they hide the altar behind a wall? It was annoying how the priest kept popping in and out of the doors like a figure on a Swiss clock. <laughs> the service dragged on following no discernible pattern, and it was interminable. Once, the priest said, let us conclude our evening prayer to the Lord. <laughs> she checked her watch again. That was ten minutes ago and still no end in sight. <laughs> so we... Um, we had a difference of opinion about the Orthodox of the church. We drove home. It was like we'd seen two different movies. He was like, that was so beautiful. Wasn't that great? That's the church i got to be a member of. I was like, no. <laughs> what was that? That was weird. That was just so foreign and weird and uninviting. Um, so we, we went through, after that, about two years where I kept saying, no, I, that, I don't understand that church. There's nothing attractive about that church. And uh, he finally got to the point where he said, you know, even if I couldn't be a pastor, if I had to just sell shoes or deliver UPS or something, I have to be in that church. That is, that is the true church. Um, so then I, I fell back on something else. I started saying, maybe we're not supposed to leave the Episcopal Church. We know that God called you here to this parish. How dare we abandon these people? Maybe the Episcopal Church is like the Titanic. It's just going to sink. Maybe there's no hope. But God needed chaplains on the Titanic. God needed chaplains to take care of the people as the ship sinks. We can't leave just because we're unhappy. Maybe we ought to stay. And he would like, Brr. he couldn't think of a comeback, you know. Uh, it took him a while, and eventually he came up with this. He said, you know what God needed on the Titanic? Lifeboats. <laughs> <laughs> we, I know where there's another ship. The ship is not sinking. <laughs> we got to get as many as we can into the lifeboats. Our, our commitment is to these people, not to you know the theoretical church or the building. So I said, "You got me. I, I I'm fresh out. That was the best I had." Um, so I agreed. I agreed to be chrismated. And it, this, as I was saying, it's a very common pattern that men get orthodoxy more easily than women do. And what is the reason? 